Welcome to part five of the art and science of construction project management. In this part, we're going to cover three topics. Uh, the first being change orders and how important they are. Uh, the second one being job completion or what most people call punch list. And the third being job debrief, which is feedback about what happened during the job uh, to impact what we do on the next project. So let's get started talking about change orders. The number one thing that I want you to understand is that change orders are inevitable. And it really doesn't matter how big your company is, if you work by yourself, if you're small, changes are going to occur. And so you have to be prepared to handle them in a way that gets you what you need. So the idea behind a change order that's really critical for you to understand, there are two things that are important. Number one, change orders are the mechanism by which you get paid for everything that changes that you should get paid for. In other words, in most legal jurisdictions, if it's not written down, if it's not signed, if it's not detailed, your clients do not have to pay you for anything that's not in the original contract. In some places, this is so strict that it absolutely has to be done. Other places, it's a little less. But in general, the law across the board is you have to have it signed if you expect to get paid for it. The other thing that needs to be thought about in terms of changes is what about all the things that get done and or are changed that have nothing to do with money but could become uh, bones of contention uh, down the road. Some things as simple as changing the design of a table that's built into somebody's kitchen or perhaps um, a color like the contract spe specifies a paint color but the color gets changed. Now I don't think it takes a lot of imagination to understand that somewhere down the road there may be somebody that questions whether that was the right thing to do. In other words, the contract said this, this was done, but nobody seems to remember the job site discussion where that decision was made. This is particularly problematic when you have two owners of a project, two owners as your clients, one you're dealing with primarily, the other one only shows up occasionally. And if they were not consulted in this, you could have a very, very serious problem. And so two big reasons for doing changes. One, it's about the money. Okay, you have to have changes signed to collect the money. And two, you just don't want anything left up to a, a conversation misunderstanding. So a good change order is written documentation of any change to the plans or the scope that indicates the cost to the client, if any, and changes to the schedule. Very critical words in here. Number one, any change. And I'm just talking any kind of change needs to be documented. It could be to the scope. It could be to the plans. Very important that it include the cost of the change to the client, if there is any. And the secondary part of it, how does it impact the schedule that you've given the client to start off with. Now, there's lots of reasons why we don't do them. And uh, it's a prevailing issue for many people in construction and, and they just don't do them. And so one of the primary reasons is that there's some kind of understanding that everybody knows that this is a change. In other words, we don't need to write this up because everybody involved, the client, us, everybody else, understands that this is a change. And so that somehow miraculously takes it out of the range of contention. Okay, and it gets even worse when somehow we assume that they know that it's gonna cost them money. And so we'll do the change, we don't ever talk about it, and then we kinda drop a bill on them at the end of the job saying, oh, and by the way, you remember when we did that? That's going to cost you $1,000. That creates real problems. And so that's a very important to understand. Second thing, maybe we're just too busy. We're busy running. We're busy doing this, doing that. And so changes don't get written. Uh, sometimes there's no cost involved, so we don't think it's very important. And 
Hopefully I can show you about that. And then I hear this phrase every now and then, I just don't want to be nickel and diming them to death. Well, here's the deal about nickel and dimes. Nickels and dimes put the original estimate together, right? Yeah. So as you move along, the nickels and dimes are going to keep you from losing money in the long run on a project. Clients know that things cost money. It's their job. I don't know if I should say it this way, but it's their job to try to get it out of us, and it's our job to try to get it out of them. Now, I know it's not that contentious all the time, but it does seem to be the mentality. If I, the client says, if I can get it for free, that's good for me. We're saying, no, you can't have it for free because I need to stay in business. And so a lot of reasons why we don't do these. Uh, I just think that we ought to think about it in terms of they absolutely have to be done. And so I think in terms of two separate forms or two separate uh, functions within the change order system. The first one is what happens on the job site. And so this usually, this can be a very simple uh, piece of paper with uh, just a few things on it. But the things that need to go into this, uh, and it's usually completed by somebody in the field staff, whether it's a project manager, lead carpenter, or, or whoever is out there in the field. And that is there's essentially four things that I want communicated from the field staff to the office on this form. And the first one would be the obvious thing like, who is the client? What job is this for? What's the job number? What's the address? What is, gonna, what is their information? The second thing would be, what is the change that we're looking at? What is it that we're looking at that we need to document? So as I suggested, sometimes these are things that the client wants done. Some of the things are the things that were just, you know, have to be done, but we're going to document them as it goes along. Probably the most important thing from a field perspective to the office is what is it going to take from the field staff to actually complete this change? And so part of that write-up would be how many hours am I going to take to actually create this change? What are the materials that I'm going to need to create this change? Are there any subcontractors involved that I need to get prices from them? And perhaps is there any administration time? Now, there are many companies that are actually charging for creating a change order. And the reason they do this is that by the time a project manager stops to talk to a client about a change order, and actually do all the work that has to be done, they've consumed at least an hour's worth of time. Well, going back to several other illustrations, that time should have been used for some other task on the job. Therefore, it doubles it. So you're talking about probably $100 worth of cost without ever doing any work. So, th so the question is, how much time did you spend doing that administrative stuff? What is it that it took you to make sure that this thing was filled out properly? And that needs to be included in the change cost to the client. Now, some companies make it an upfront direct cost. It's kind of in your face. Every time you want to change, it's going to cost you $75 or $100 or whatever it is. Other companies are a little more subtle, which I prefer. And they just make sure that as they're going through the change order process that they get paid all the way through. So if the client doesn't take one change order, all that time may get accumulated into another change order, but you're getting paid for what you do. And then the last thing I think needs to be looked at is what's this going to do in terms of the time frame of the job? Are we going to be adding a week? Are we going to be adding two weeks? Are we adding three days? what happens to that from a field perspective. So the second thing, the second form, which is primarily created uh, from the office of a company, would include some of the same kinds of things, but a little bit different emphasis. So this final form that comes out from the office, in other words, what is it the client's eventually going to 
see and uh, probably sign would certainly have the client's name, job information, address, all those kinds of things. A description of the change, now this typically will be written a little more fluidly, a little more tailored uh, as a legal document going back to the client, but it would have all the same ingredients that have come from the field uh, to the office. The charge or the added amount to the client, in other words, this change order is going to add $16,122 to this contract amount. So they know, the client knows, this is going to increase their cost in the final analysis by this amount. Now what we've learned about clients over the years is they don't add. <laughs> and what that basically means is they don't take the time to say, if I'm adding $16,000 to the cost of my project, my new budget is now $152,122. So what needs to be done is from the construction company or from the company as a whole, you need to have that final contract amount or that adjusted contract amount on that change order. So they can start seeing right away, are they bumping up against their real budget or are they going over their real budget or where are they in terms of their financial planning? Because that's the number that's really critical. It's not so much the added amount, but where are they in terms of the, their ability to pay for everything, not just the change. So that goes into that. Then we need to make sure we have the added time in terms of working days. And much like the completion contract amount, we need to put a new completion date in there. Now it's very important that the time be specific. If you work in terms of calendar weeks, you need to make sure it says calendar weeks or calendar days. If you work, work in terms of working days like Monday through Friday, then you need to be sure that change says working days, which would take out Christmas and Thanksgiving and the holidays as well. And then with that new completion date, you need to look forward and say, so instead of January 15th, the job will now be completed January 22nd because we added X number of working days. So this is then the form that would go back out to the client to have them to sign and document that they approve the change. Now obviously if we're not changing the cost, that line item would be zero. If we're not changing the amount of time that goes into the project, that would be zero. And you'd have the same contract amount and the same completion date, but it's still on there because this draws attention to the fact that if they change something else, it's going to have a ramification. Now sometimes those things that we often think, well, this really doesn't change much, really does change things. And so we really have to think carefully as to whether this is a charge or a no charge kind of thing. One of my favorite examples, and again, I go back to the world of remodeling, is if a client wants you to move the wall of a powder room three inches because they just want a little more space in there and you haven't built the wall yet, our tendency is to think that really doesn't cost anything. Well, as pointed out, it costs something to talk to the client. So there's a cost. But secondly, what about having to reframe for the toilet because now the toilet flange hits a floor joist? Hmm, that's going to cost you some money. And what about the fact that the flooring in the hall, which is adjacent to that powder room, is much, much, much less expensive than the flooring in the bathroom, and now you've added another, I don't know, five square feet to that flooring price. And so it really is dangerous to kind of rush into a change and just because it seems like a simple task, you end up costing yourself money where you really shouldn't have to. And so that's a, just a kind of a warning in terms of those things that we think may or may not be cost to the client. So part of the deal with winning the game of change orders is to really have 
good expectations set throughout the process. So we would start these expectations in the contract language. So part of your contract really has to state what do we do about change orders? This is the way we handle change orders. This is the way we deal with them. Now, if you don't want to do totally fixed cost pricing in your contract, you need to stipulate what does time and materials mean? Because there may be some changes that just need to be done time and materials because they have to be done right now. We don't have time to wait for you to see what we're doing. We need to move on and the client will say, go ahead with time and materials. But in your contract, it needs to say, time will be charged out this way, $75 an hour or $100 an hour for these people, uh, $50 an hour for these people, materials will be charged at cost plus whatever percentage. So the client has a very good idea of how much this thing's going to cost them in the long run. But the change order needs to be discussed through the sales process and in the contract language. I mentioned the pre-construction meeting where I thought the lead carpenter or at least the production manager needs to address the change order as part of that conversation. And I think that's a critical thing for opening the door. Just making sure that the conversation is out there in public. It's not uh, a surprise when it happens on the job site, but everybody understands where we are with that. And then the last expectation setting situation is the job site discussions. And so this is where the client and the project leader, project manager are having a conversation the client says, I'd like to have this changed, or they run into some rot, or whatever the situation is. One of the critical things is learning how to set an expectation. If you're a business owner, manager, uh, going through this series of, of seminars, one of the things that you'll want to start doing, I believe, is start training your field staff to learn how to respond to whatever the client says. There's all kinds of responses they have, and you want to make sure that your team knows how you want them to respond. Uh, many of the times uh, when clients just go something like, wow, that's a lot of money, a person working on the job may go, yeah, it really is. And when that happens, there's a dynamic that's already set up where the client's already won. And so you have to train them how, in that case, to not respond. That's a perfect illustration of where you just don't respond. What can you say when a client says, that's a lot of money? You can't say, no, it's not, because it is. <laughs> or, and you don't want to say, yeah, you're right, it really is, because they're sort of getting the upper hand then. And so the ideal scenario is to wait, and you might say, why do you say that? And then let the client download what they're thinking from there, then it's much easier to deal with. So my point basically being that this is the point where a lot of change order issues develop, where the expectation's not set properly out on the job site. So field staff, people that work for you, and if you use sub-trades who are not uh, financially tied to you except the fact that you pay them, you really have to train them because there you can get into all kinds of problems if they don't answer properly uh, when a client says something. So what I'd like to do is kind of walk you through the four scenarios that I've seen in terms of changes and maybe give you a little bit of uh, language that would help so you don't walk into some trouble in terms of trying to create changes. Obviously, we can't cover every single thing in this short amount of time, but basically there are four. There's the client-driven request when the client says, I would like you to do this, or I'd like to find out how much this costs. There's the unforeseen conditions that are clearly unforeseen. In other words, nobody could have seen that these are uh, there was a problem in this wall. Rot is a great example of that. Uh, termite damage could be a good example of it. Moisture issues uh, other than just rot. 
The third thing is sales promised it, but it wasn't written down. Remember, we talked a lot about setting that expectation that if it's not in the scope, it's not in the plans, then we can't do it without a change order. So here's a situation where sales really did promise it, but it's not written down somewhere. How should somebody handle that? And then there's the, we should have been able to see this. And this is a classic uh, problem. Sales estimating design. Somebody has looked at the project. They didn't see a potential problem. Uh, but when the carpenters or the people doing the job get on the job, it's clear as day to them. And so that creates this conflict that's very difficult to resolve. And hopefully I can give you some ideas on that. So let's start with that first one, the client driven request. So a client comes to somebody in the company, whether it's you as the owner, one of your salespeople or a field member and asks, we would like to know how much this would cost. Or we were at Home Depot last night or some other lumber yard and we saw this amazing window and we just thought it would go great on this wall. How much do you think it would cost to put that window in? So here's where we get into that scenario of setting expectations. The thing you never ever want to say is, sure, we can do anything. Because right there, you've set the expectation that it's not going to be very expensive, that it's very easy to do, and it might actually be included in the price of the project. And so you've set an expectation that's very hard to backtrack from. And so the ease at which you answered, the, uh, the ease at which you said, yeah, that's kind of easy, that's an easy thing to do, really set you up for failure. And so what you want to start conditioning yourself and others in your company to say is something to the effect of this. I'm sure it can be done, but it will cost additional money and add some time to the project. And then you might say following that, would you like me to see how much? Because you want them to choose between, yes, I want to spend more money or no, I don't want to spend more money. The other thing that happens right here in the conversation is you can actually have a 10 minute conversation instead of a 50 minute conversation and still get the same results. So if you say, I'm sure we can do it, but it will add money to the project, they have the opportunity to say, well, we don't want to do that. And you're done. It doesn't take you 50 minutes. But if you have a long drawn out conversation with them and then at the end of it say, yeah, I'm sure it's going to add money. And they say, oh, well, it's going to add money. We don't want to do it. You've wasted lots and lots of time. And so you want to set the expectation right up front. It's going to cost money and it's going to add some time. You want to talk with a client. If they say, well, yes, yeah, see what's going on. You want to talk with a client, find out exactly what they're talking about. What is that window? Uh, how big is it? How much does it cost? Maybe you need to call the lumber yard to find that out. Or are they going to provide the window and you're going to install it? What, what is it that they want done? For some people who are a little more skilled in sales, one of the things you can do right here is ask them if they have a budget in mind. And for example, if they've gone and looked at that new window, the window costs $500 and they say, well, uh, yeah, we really don't want to spend more than $750. Well, right away, $500 window, $250 in labor and other miscellaneous materials, I could pretty well tell them it's going to be more than $750. I have to work out all the details, but I'm, I'm sure it's going to be more than that. Are you open to spending more than that? And by doing that, then again, you're setting an expectation. They now know that when your number comes back, there's a more than 50% chance that it's going to be more than $750. And so they're not surprised after a lot of work has been done. And then the final thing here is just advise them how long it's going to take for somebody to get back to them about exactly how much that's going to cost them. This is important, again, just basic communication. When will I be able to get back to you on this information? So if this is a field member, they may actually be filling that form out 
emailing it or faxing it in or however they get it into the office and somebody else might be actually filling out that final cost report or that final change order. Now the second illustration is these unforeseen conditions and I mentioned rot, I mentioned termite, there's all kinds of things. A roofing project, you start tearing off the roof and lo and behold there's lots of bad uh, decking material that all has to be replaced. Now I know many roofers include X amount of uh, repair in their budget, uh, some may not. But let's just suppose there is this unforeseen condition. And so maybe you run into this termite problem, uh, the clients aren't home or maybe they are home. One of the really important things here is that you never want to proceed with doing any work until the client gives you permission to spend their money. The original contract gives you permission to spend $100,000 of their money. That's done. You've gotten that permission. Any additional expense requires their permission, even on a just emotional level. So let's take the rot example. You open up a wall, you've got rot in a wall, you can contact the client. One of the great things about our uh, tech situation nowadays is they are almost inexcusable from answering a question that we have. Even if they're halfway around the world, we could find them through email or texting even or other means of communication. So what we want to do is we want to contact them. We're going to say something like this, whether it's written or verbal. I've uncovered some rot damage or some termite damage in the front wall. Would you like me to see what the additional cost or time impact will be? Or you might say, would you, would you like uh, me to go ahead and write this up as a change and send it over? Or you might even say, we found this rot damage. It looks like it's going to be about six hours. Would you like me to take care of it on a time and materials basis if that's available within the company? So the big deal here, like I already said, is you want them to be the ones that say, go ahead and spend my money. Do not assume that because they really don't have any choice, they're going to be okay with it. Uh, it's just a big mistake to say, well, what are we going to do if they say, they're not going to say no, right? And so many of these unforeseen conditions, how can the client say no? Well, they don't say no, but they do resent the fact that you went ahead and did it without them saying, yes, have, go ahead and do it. So the next example would be, we just need to get this stuff done to keep this job moving. Okay, and so uh, maybe it could have been seen, uh, maybe sales uh, should have seen it, but they didn't. Now the really critical thing here is that all kinds of feelings pop up at that point. I think it should have been included. Uh, I don't know if sales really did their due diligence. I don't know if they really tried to see this. And yet here I am kind of stuck dealing with the client. So one of the things to remember here, especially if you're out in the field or, and this is something you can convey to your field staff if you're the owner of a company, is that if sales had seen it, they would have put it in the contract. So basically, the contract price would have been a little bit higher. So in, 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 uh, that's just another way of saying, in reality, the client is the one who would have been paying for this, and now we're just catching it, so they're going to end up paying for it. But the important thing is, don't give in to any of the things that sort of make it feel like it's a bad decision to charge the client for it. So what you want to do, if you go back to that previous example, is have the conversation with the client, ask them what, you want, what they want you to do. Don't give them the option of, we can just throw it in, but address it as a change. How do they want you to spend their money? And then the last uh, illustration for change orders is this one where uh, the salesperson said, yes, we can build that cabinet in the corner of your room. I'm sure we'll have some extra plywood laid, left over, so shouldn't take much. So yes, we can do that, but it never got written down. And in this case, uh, you're going to have that conversation with the client. 
Uh, you're going to want to talk to your sales staff and find out what really happened. Is the client just playing you, which they will do at times, not always, but occasionally, or is this something really that a salesperson or the owner of the company promised in a sales environment? One of the things you want to watch out for is all the nonverbal cues that give you away. And the only way I can kind of illustrate this is I think human nature is to kind of pick off or pick on the weaknesses of other people. And I don't think everybody's evil and everybody's bad, but I think by nature, we are people very much like animals, although I don't think we're animals, but very much like animals that we tend to try to get what we want through whatever way we can. And so if a client sees that you don't quite believe your salespeople, they're going to play that and eventually they're going to get that thing for free. So watch out for that. Let the salespeople come in and help you solve this problem. Let them talk it through with the client. And, but if it does change, it absolutely has to be addressed as part of a change order. So just a few things as we wrap up this little section on change orders. Uh, essentially, you really have to know what's in the budget, what's not in the budget, if you're going to be diligent about watching out for these changes. Complete something in writing for everything that changes. And I know this is hard to do. I know it seems to take an extra, a lot of time. But the reality is, is if it's not documented in writing, it could come back to haunt you. One of the things that happens is we get away with it, get away with it, get away with it, get away with it, and then all of a sudden, boom, it hits us, and then we're in trouble. So make a habit of documenting everything. Insist that everyone in the company do the same. Doesn't matter who it is, business owner, sales, production, doesn't matter who, everybody writes it up. Make sure you have it on file in the office and be sure the form includes the cost, the change to the overall price, any additional days, new completion dates, and oh, and yes, any impact it's going to have on deadlines like a wedding. So, and I say this because sometimes we assume the client is going to pick up on that without us saying it. But if there's a deadline involved and that change order pushes it past the wedding, or past that deadline, you be sure and bring it up because that will alert them to the fact that they have to make some adjustments in the plan so that they don't end up backed up against this change in the project. Okay, let's talk about uh, job completion. And I alluded to this when we talked about checklists in uh, part four, but I want to go ahead and elaborate this on this. This is one of my missions with the uh, construction world and that is to help contractors of all varieties be able to get to the point where when they finish a project it's really done and when they walk away from it they can pick up that last check and that the only thing they have to go back for is legitimate warranty items. And just to give you a little bit of feedback on this and why I know this works is that when I was doing installations for a company that does kitchens and bathrooms, I was doing bathroom installations. I worked as what I call a lead carpenter, basically took the job from the very beginning all the way to the last day. And we would give the clients a schedule before the job started and on the last day of the schedule was our job walkthrough. And that was our goal. Our goal was to literally make that walkthrough on the day that it was scheduled. Because in some cases, people had to set up their work schedules to be able to go to that walkthrough. And so understand that sometimes these schedules were set up six weeks or so, or perhaps eight weeks before the end of the job even occurred. And so my challenge was to go through three weeks of bathroom remodel, get everything done, and then on that very last day, I would have a list. Now, we weren't quite done, all right? So there were things like 
a light fixture that had to be installed or a toilet that had to be installed. The majority of the systems were all done and in place. But the jobs that I did for this company, I literally had that meeting in the morning of the last day and walked out of that job at the end of the day with a check in hand and everything complete. And so when I'm talking about these things that I want to share with you uh, as we look at this, this is not pie in the sky. Other companies I've known and talked with are doing what they call zero punch. And these are not bathroom and kitchen companies. These are full line remodeling companies. In other words, they're taking a whole house, tearing the second floor off, doing, redoing the entire thing with new uh, second floor, that kind of thing, and actually walking through at the end of the job and having no list from the client. So that's what I'm trying to help companies achieve uh, through this little discussion. So this might get you started thinking about it, but I encourage you to really pursue it, find ways that you can make it happen because it'll make your lives a whole lot easier. So the issues that we have with this process, I think are two, uh, maybe three, but we'll just talk about two here. Number one, if we start creating lists at the end of the job, the client starts adding to that list. And there's a joke going around that's basically the ongoing punch list. And so there's a list, it's almost done, you go back to collect the che check and the client has another list, right? And so you're almost done and then the client has another list. And so two months after the project is really supposed to be done, somebody's still going back. Now, how much does each one of those trips cost you? Way more than if you'd done some things to start with to keep that from happening. Now, is that possible with every client? I'm not going to guarantee that, but it's possible with many more than we actually achieve. The other thing that I think is a serious issue with the way we do job completion is that we essentially f leave the client in charge of finding problems with the work that we do. And this became really clear to me when I started thinking about the way other businesses turn over a finished product to a client. And I thought immediately about car dealers. And I've only bought maybe three cars in my lifetime. We tend to keep them until they absolutely fall apart, so we don't buy them very often. But I've never bought a car where once we signed all the papers, the salesperson said to me, hey, let's go look at your car and see what's wrong with it. That would be stupid. So why is it that we, as an industry, essentially invite people in to the project to say, let's find out what's wrong, let's put a little blue sticky on it, and then I'll work really hard to try to make you happy fixing those things. So I just think that We've got it all topsy-turvy and backwards, and it doesn't work. So <clears throat> what do we want to have happen? And this is, from my frame of reference, identifying what we want and then building something that makes it happen is really important. And I think we've fallen into the trap that says punch list is just what happens. You know, I, I don't think that's true, but I think we've fallen into that trap. So what do we want to have happen? We want to finish the job strong and actually finish when projected uh, that everything is completed. In other words, we want to finish on that completion date. We want to know that when we get to that last day on the job, everything's taken care of. The second thing is that we want to convince our clients that we are responsible and that we are not trying to get away with leaving them in the lurch. Now, they hear so many stories about people who walked off the job when things weren't finished and took the money and ran. So their expectation is they have to catch us. Uh, you may remember the movie, Catch Me If You Can, and I kind of think that's the way clients are thinking about us. We're running, we're trying to hide, and they have to catch us. So we want to work through the process 
so that when a client thinks about us, they say, you know what? I don't have to catch them. They're taking care of things. They're looking out for me. They are unlike the report that I saw the other day on 2020. Now, let's talk about how to make this happen. So the first thing, like scheduling, like so many other parts of this is, is attitude. What is the attitude that we need to get across within our company and get across to our clients? And the, the, it's basically summed up like this. There is no such thing as a punch list. Now you just stop and let that resonate for a minute. Wouldn't that be beautiful? No such thing as a punch list. Because unless we have that attitude, it is human nature to leave stuff to go on that punch list. In other words, we see some problems with the drywall, we just say, oh, we'll catch that on the punch list. We see one piece of trim that isn't exactly right, and we say in our head, we'll just get that on the punch list. One piece of tile that isn't quite right, we'll just put that on the punch list. And so by doing that then, these are obvious things. These are things that we've seen for weeks and weeks and weeks, but instead of dealing with them, we start talking about how we're gonna catch them on the punch list. So developing the attitude that says, you know what, I have nowhere to write this down. There is no list for me to write this on that we're gonna call a punch list, so I have to deal with it as I go along. I've already talked about using a checklist for the punch. And this is something that I think is really, really critical. So you have a checklist that identifies the 25, 30, 40, 50, it doesn't matter how many things that have to be checked by somebody on the job before, before we allow the client to walk through with us as a final walkthrough. Now on this list, there ought to be some of the obvious things like I mentioned before, paint on hardware, door stoppers in place, all the screens for the windows are there, the dishwasher works, the oven works, all the different things, you know, all the drawers work, all the drawers are clean, right? How many times did we walk through and there's a little bit of that drill dust inside the drawer that someone forgot to clean out because there's uh, they, they just got in a hurry. All those kinds of things. But I think also on their list, there ought to be some things like grab a drywall bucket and sit down in the kitchen and look at the kitchen from the perspective of someone sitting at a table. And see, that changes your perspective. It gets you to look up underneath the cabinets. Now, the clients are going to do that. They're going to sit down and have lunch one day and go, ooh, that looks ugly. This was brought home to me one day. Went to visit some friends. Beautiful kitchen. I, I just was impressed with the, ability, you know, the amazing quality of this kitchen. We sat down to lunch, and the line between the tile and the wall cabinets was all jagged. I mean, it looked like someone had just nipped everything with a, a tile nipper. And I went, ugh, that looks ugly. <laughs> and so my impression of the work dropped incredibly by sitting down in the kitchen. Another thing that you can do is sit on the toilet. A lot of people spend time on the toilet looking around. They're gonna see things differently than you just standing there. Uh, make sure you take your tools off, right? Others have said lay down in the tub. You know, put something in there before you get in there because you don't wanna scratch it up. But these are the kinds of things that if you do them and you do them well, then you're gonna catch those things that only the client will catch uh, through use. Another thing you can do is make lists as you go. And this is a, a task that my wife taught me to do and I've really picked up on it in terms of construction. Just as I'm working through the project, I'm writing down lists of things I need to do. What this does is this allows you to see and keep track of every detail as you go. And instead of just kind of leaving it, you put it on the list and then it's easier for you to go back and pick it up rather than leave it for the client. Another thing, finish tasks as you go. This is so obvious, uh, but it needs to be said. A lot of people just stop and then they come back the next day, they get into something new and that task doesn't get complete. 
or probably more likely they run short a little bit on some trim or short on some materials and they don't go right back to it. And so my, my inclination is make sure you have that material the next day, get right back on there, finish everything for a certain task at one time. One of the things that works really well is to get feedback from your client as you go along. Now, we're not asking them to come through and do a punch list, but we're asking them to give us some feedback. Uh, one, of the, one company I know is actually going to use a whiteboard and leave it on the job where the client can see it and ask the client, anything you see that you'd like us to look at or pay attention to, just write it up on that whiteboard. And what you're doing is you're asking the client to tell you before it's too late what their concerns are because all of them will have a little bit different view of the different aspects of the job. The other thing that happens is once they put it on the whiteboard or once they tell it to you and you write it down, as soon you do it right away and you cross it off or you do it right away and you show the client that you've done it. What you're doing is creating a trust environment. The client says, hey, this is important to me, and you say, it's important to me too, in the way you respond. And so by doing that, then they start feeling like, I don't have to catch these guys. I can share it with them. They're gonna take care of whatever I need done. And also, you don't end up at the end of the project with all the drop claws cleaned up, everything put away, you're walking through the, with the client and the client says, oh, I don't like this. And I've been looking at it for three weeks. I just didn't know what I was supposed to do. So get the client in on some of these things. It creates trust and you can address their concerns very quickly. One of the best things that can be done in any company is to invite in what I'm gonna call the second set of eyes. And that basically is somebody else that's going to come in and look over what you've done. Uh, one of my experiences was I had a painter that had finished. I was working on the bathroom. One of our salespeople came in and said, wow, that paint doesn't look very good at all. Well, I hadn't seen it. I was so focused on the other stuff, I had missed it. And then when I really looked at it, yeah, it needed to be fixed. So having that second set of eyes come in. Companies that are doing this very effectively, you know, the lead carpenter will do a list, the production manager will come in and do a list, the owner of the company will come in and do a list, and then when all that's done, they invite the client in. And very, very seldom do they ever have anything that the client finds. So it works very well. We're still working on how this works, and uh, so we use a predetermined checklist. I've talked about that a little bit. Uh, I mentioned the way I've done things with the bath remodels where I'd come to the end of the job and I would come with a list. So in other words, instead of a blank sheet of paper, which sort of says, you have to tell me what I have to do. That's what it says non-verbally. You have, I would have, you should have a list of everything that you already see that needs to be done and then you might leave a little space for them to add to it. And again, this is one of those things that creates trust. And then the last thing I'd like to see happen is just change the name. You know, punch list is by definition a antagonistic term. Clients are taught by the media and by their friends that they have to catch you at what you do. And we in the process are trying to, I don't know if we're trying to hide or we just don't want to have to do it. So what I'd like to see happen is for you to start addressing these things as maybe a final celebration or final job walkthrough or whatever you want to call it, but something other than a punch list. It will definitely change the dynamic of the meeting. And so I have here for you to look at uh, just a sample punch list checklist. And so you can see uh, there's nothing really elaborate about it. It's just simple stuff going through. But as long as it's there, it forces me to carefully check those items. Every company should be making it uh, for themselves. Every time there's a problem area that seems to keep popping up, 
we should definitely have that list. And so by doing this, not with the client, but doing it before the client walks through, then you stand a better chance of finishing these jobs very, very strongly. Okay, let's tackle the last uh, subject of this seminar, and that is the job debrief. Now, uh, there are lots of different names for this. Some people call it the job autopsy. Uh, I like the debrief just because it doesn't sound like the job is dead. Uh, so the idea of this job debrief is that we need to take some time to continually improve what we do. So at the beginning of this seminar, in part one, we started with the idea of a great estimate, and then we went through 11 other topics. And what we want to see happening is that as you do your job, as you work through these things, that you start identifying items, issues, problem areas that you can be working on. And by doing that then, you get better and better and better at your business. So this job debrief is the opportunity for the people that are involved in the process of your business, whether it be production people, whether it be trade contractors, whether it be sales, all of those people coming together and saying, how can we do this better? So here's a few ideas on how you can do that and what impact it may have on your business. So essentially what we're talking about is another meeting. And uh, it can be a really good meeting or it can be just so exhausting and so meaningless that nothing ever happens as a result of it. And of course I want you to have the really good meeting. But it basically is at the end of the job when every party can bring info about what has worked and what did not work. And so for some companies, this might be just one person sitting down to look at this. Other companies, it might be a couple of people. For others, it might be four or five for, doing, uh, for looking at a very, very big job. Now, the problems that I've seen when companies have tried to do this, it becomes way too long. Uh, they spend very much like that turnover meeting I was talking about. It's like every line item, every detail, every little problem area. And after a while, people are just saying, let me out of here. I don't have anything more to contribute. Uh, too many issues are brought up. In other words, we had a real bad job. There were multiple issues. And so we feel like we can tackle them all. And I think anybody that knows human nature is you can't tackle them all. And tackling one at a time is about the best you're going to get. And I think the other issue that we end up with is we get out of these meetings having done a lot of talking. We've talked, we've talked, we've talked. But when it's all done, there's no commitment, no plan for change, no direction that all that talking is done. And for most people, just don't even ask me if nothing's going to change. And so this has to be an environment where we look for something to change. So how do we make this happen? So basically a job is finished. Uh, we have all the information in that we need. We've paid our bills. Job cost reports are done. We get a client satisfaction survey done and we find out how did we do financially? How do we do for customer service? How do we do on our schedule? Those are the big, the big items. So we hand out information to all the people in on paper or in a computer form to let them review everything before they come to the meeting. This is what keeps us from having to talk about every little detail throughout the entire meeting. And so everybody looks at it before they get there. Lead carpenter, project manager, whoever it is, sales, everybody looks at it before they get there. The meeting actually goes on the job schedule. So the job doesn't end on the last day of the job, but at two weeks later, there's a debrief for that job. The very important thing is that everyone should bring one, one thing to the meeting that they learned on the job, that if it would change, it would change the outcome of future jobs. So in other words, there may be 10 things that went wrong, 10 issues that occurred, 
But what they want to do is find out what is the one from their perspective that if we changed it, it would most influence the way this company does business or the way future jobs uh, end up. So if you do that, say, then you've got three things to talk about and not 50 things to talk about. And you can actually reduce this meeting to a very short, perhaps an hour, worth of time. So those things are brought into the meeting. They're discussed among the people that are there. And then out of that, the group should pick one. <laughs> and again, if we try to focus on all three of them or all four of them, if there's four people in the meeting, then we're probably going to dilute the impact on the company. So what you want to do is everybody brings an idea. They're discussed in enough detail where you can agree that this one, doesn't matter who brought it, is the one that's going to change the company or change outcomes most dramatically. And so you actually agree as a team to a solution or a problem that needs a solution. So then the next step is actually creating that solution. Now there's a temptation that says, you know, well, Bill, you brought up that point, so why don't you find a solution and we'll have a meeting next week? Well, just because Bill brought up the problem doesn't need, mean that Bill has a solution. He's only identified the problem. Oh, and by the way, I really don't like the idea that don't you come to me a problem with a problem unless you have a solution. Many people can identify problems and they're very legit, but they don't always have the solution. So as a business owner, you need to encourage people to tell you when there are problems and then ask if they have solutions and work with them to create solutions. So what I'd rather see happen is the problems are identified, you identify the problem that everybody wants to work on, throw out some ideas at the end of that meeting as to what are some of the possible solutions. If you can, pick the one that's gonna work best for everybody and then set up a goal to actually make that happen. If you can't pick one, then I think it would be okay to ask somebody to sort of look at those and refine them. Let's get back together in a week so we can come up with a solution. You really don't want to have two meetings. If you can avoid it, try to have just one. So with that one thing that's going to be the solution, you set a plan in place to make it happen and get everyone to commit to making that happen. Creating SMART goals is one of the best ways to do that, but also then how do you actually meet that SMART goal? Thus what you have to be thinking about. So in summary for part five here, we have change orders. Very, very important that you document every change to the scope and the plans. And again, I just want to emphasize the fact that for many people, they get by, they get by, they get by, and then boom, they get slammed by somebody and lose thousands and thousands of dollars because they just didn't take the time to document things that change. And so make sure you do that as a result uh, in your business so that you're actually documenting those things. Start looking at the way you finish up jobs. And again, I just want to emphasize that attitude is really key. Getting people in your business to look at this thing and say, we are not going to have a list when we get to walk that client through. We're going to have a party is what we're going to have. And therefore, uh, you'll actually do it if you have that kind of an attitude. And then use this debrief. Uh, use the, that meeting at the end of the job so that you can continually work on the processes and the systems. So like I said before, we started at one place and we didn't really end at the other end. We actually went around in a circle. So that debrief and everything else we do is supposed to impact everything else on this circle. And by doing that, your company gets better and better with time. Well, that concludes part five of the art and science of construction project management. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. I really, really hope that everything I've shared with you makes a difference in your business and that actually leads you to better profitability and certainly greater customer satisfaction. Thank you.
Tim Fowler started his construction career as a custom home builder and remodeler prior to becoming lead carpenter and production manager for a home builder in 1988. He later founded his own remodeling company, Falcon. In 1999, Tim established Field Training Services, where he develops training programs for production staff and job site management. He is author of The Lead Carpenter Handbook, The Complete Hands-On Guide to Successful Job Site Management. Tim has also produced CDs and manuals on human resources and employee evaluation systems. Many of the forms shown in the preceding seminar are available free on his website, 